Jeez, there's a Sandhurst allotment. We've got a generation with a lot of problems. It's a very difficult time to live. You know, if you're between 18 and 26 at the moment, you're probably unemployed. That's the first thing. What we've pulled into Sandhurst is genuinely the very best, I believe, of that generation. Get going! But I wonder sometimes what motivates them. Get over it! Get to the front! Get moving! Fucking move! Get, get, get down! Get over it! I feel for some people who come here, and they're here because their father was in the regiment, their grandfather was in the regiment, and so it's an automatic assumption they would come, and they're manifestly not suited to the place. On your back! On your face! It's a shame they're not weeded out before they get through the gates. But you can see there's some people whose hearts simply aren't in it, and they'd be really well suited to something else other than the military. The worst thing to happen is that they go out to Afghanistan and hesitate. Something goes wrong, and they don't want to act. Or they break down and suddenly get a sort of stab of conscience that says, I shouldn't be here. Oxford Sandy and Blacks, an outstanding pig, very good for pork and bacon. Oh God! Oh God! As you can see there, okay, he placed one foot forward in a boxing stance. The knees are bent, okay. That allows his gravity, his centre of gravity, to be lowered, okay, and easily, more easily controlled. OK, and the bayonet is pointing towards the enemy. And as you can see, there is a large amount of steel and determination in his eyes to kill that enemy. Ah! Rubbish! Ah! Right. Oh, God! Oh, God! Ah! Wow. Ah! Wow. Ah! Ah! What's your name? Mr. Ray Thompson, for sir. Mr. Thompson, I've got lock on you. You need to get a grip of your skinny body and show me that you've got some aggression, because at this moment in time... It's funny what we're doing here, isn't it? You're on the range, it's funny. What is funny about an 18-year-old or possibly yourself going through a door and thrusting a bayonet through somebody's rib cage, standing on the throat, looking at them dying, and withdrawing the bayonet out and then going on and killing the next person. What is funny about that? Nothing! Nothing. Just me two commanders. You don't understand what you're going to be asked to do. That person that goes through the door <laughs> may die, and it's going to be you that sends it through the door. And at this moment in time, you stood there, marking time, not giving a shit. You're a fucking embarrassment! Motivators, get them away, I've had enough. Go! Munch, all yours! Is there anybody here who did not volunteer to join the army? Don't ever under any illusion, you are volunteers, you want to be here. It's the army now. You have to remember that you are leaders of men and women, that you will be required to give orders, but more importantly, ensure that those orders are carried out. Doing that has its own moral implications, especially when you, through your words, your orders and your actions, put another person's life in jeopardy. We've all got this sort of heroic self-sacrifice mentality. I'll lay down my life for queen and country. When it comes to laying somebody else's life down for queen and country, you have to live with that for the rest of your days, and that can be really painful. Yet it is what the army is asking of you, to be of a strong enough character and leader to be able to fulfill orders that no right-thinking person want to fulfill, and then carry on after that. It's an awesome responsibility. If you're not ready for that, then go pack your bags. It's in Afghanistan, you'll be facing that sort of time. OK? I, 
I've got sort of quite a big history with the army, um, like my father, my grandfather, great grandfather. Yeah. And to have to pull out, I think to be able to do that and facing up to that as well would be a huge challenge and a challenge that I would not like to experience. I have to say. They say um, 80% of people start Sandhurst with a girlfriend and 20% of people smoke. And by the time you leave, 20% uh, of people have girlfriends and 80% of smoke. So this kind of works, works with the uh, statistics, really, doesn't it? We did have we had a lot of conversations when I came back that leave weekend, but yeah, she did, she didn't just dump me by text. Or was it? It's not quite that that tragic. They got to be strong before you can come here. Otherwise, they're not really gonna last two minutes. I think not that I, that was a dig or anything in any way. You know, like oh, I haven't spoken to my girlfriend since what day is it today? Friday today. So like, I usually speak every day. I haven't spoken to her like Tuesday was the last time I spoke to her. Cause you just get you know by the time I come back, she's in bed. So I just haven't got the time. So you know, if you've got problems or you know. Or if you've got a needy bird and she's, you've got to be constantly ringing her and giving her attention, it's never going to work. But, um, yeah, it definitely puts a strain on it. I suppose girls are different from boys in that, in that way, aren't they? They need a little bit more attention. You can't just pick them up and leave them where you left off like you can with your mates. It's like a, it's like a, a plant that you've got to keep watering. He's like my Sandhurst dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I get is advice and help from everything. It's great. <laughs> saw that the, these terrorist attacks had happened. And I, f I felt it quite personally. I felt like it was an attack on, on UK and the UK values. And maybe that's what I'm fighting for. It's not patriotism so much as liberalism. I despise the idea that people think that they should be able to take it away from us. You're not in it for the medals, you know, but the Afghan one means more. That shadow it up. You certainly know that you weren't that one. I would like to go to Afghanistan because I think it's it's the job that you're signing up for now. Even Sandhurst, which is a bastion of tradition and all this stuff, is changing its syllabus because of Afghanistan. It's the challenge of our generation, really. I think two squadrons are going out in 2013. Maybe in the same brigade as the Welsh Guards. Does that make you nervous? Yeah, it does. Terrified. You think about it with the amount of training that you have at the moment, and you know we made a you know we made a bit of a bit of a mess of our last team attack, and but you still think about oh yeah when they get to Afghanistan, you know I mean if you took on the Taliban with <laughs> skills and drills like that, <laughs> you know you, you you do the honest thing and just shoot yourself I think. We've got such a long way to go to get to that stage where we can confidently get to a platoon or troop our uh, chosen regiments and lead them with all the qualities that is expected of an officer coming out of Santos. This is a video someone was saying about the, um, an Iraqi sniper in Baghdad. And he's he's filmed all of the uh, all of his kills, like as he's done them, which is and put them into this horrible video. You can see why they do it. It's, the effect's twofold. It puts fear into soldiers operating in an environment where they know there's a sniper about, so that you can never feel comfortable. You know, you're seeing them soldiers, and they're just on top. It's pretty disgusting, actually. They're not really expecting it, which is the whole nature of a sniper threat. And then, bang, you know, from nowhere. And by filming it, they can just show it worldwide and little potential jihadists can sit there on their internet, whether they be in Kabul, Baghdad, 
Whitechapel, and it's just propaganda, isn't it? So, in the same way that they might see us as watching Ross Kemp in Afghanistan's propaganda, but you don't see us filming down our sniper scopes, picking off Taliban, so. But that's how they fight, so they fucking let them. When I was about 14, my father died. I was the oldest child. I kind of thought, well, I've got to... That's it, I've got to, like, like man up. And then the whole careers liaison ca guy came in, and I kind of thought, well, if my if like, dad's not around, then I've got to go and sort my life out and, and, and kind of grow up a bit. So I've known what I've wanted to do for a long time. Mr Barnes, I like Mr Barnes very much. He's kind of a what you see is what you get kind of guy, and what yeah. you see is a sort of professional front, which is good, but I think he can still give a, more, give, give a bit more. I think he's holding back a little bit. OK, we've got the curtains half closed in here, Mr Barnes. That says to me that you feel that you're still in bed. Get in here now. Get in bed. Get in your bed. You want to be in bed because your curtains are still fucking drawn. That says to me that you are still tired, all right? Am I... Get in bed. OK? Why are your curtains still drawn? I'm not sure, Councillor. I'm no excuse, Councillor. Stand to attention while you're in bed, OK? To that end, the curtains should be wide open, understand? Yes, Councillor. Southworth wasn't there next. I just think he's quite wet. I think he's a particular team player up in the lines. I think I put hardly inspirational down. You've been shaving your pubic area with this razor? I'm pretty sure I haven't, Councillor. Right, well, it's got ginger pubes in it. OK, and your ginger, to that end, OK, requires to be removed from the razor. This goes on. Uh, Mr Thompson, with a P, yeah. with a P he's, okay. he's a good guy, he's fit. And he's got an opinion as well, which I quite like. He doesn't sort of just... He's top third material, not middle third, by which he yeah. actually has a voice and he uses it, which is good. Yeah. I think he just needs to understand how much he can deliver and how much he can deliver to, into the platoon. Platoon dynamics. I think there was an aspect by which he doesn't have much military experience. He's been an electrician for four years or whatever it is beforehand. And I was putting himself down a bit in the interview and I just said, hey, listen, these are skills. You've got some good, good life experience that'd be really yeah. handy. Um, so share it around and don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, Mr. Ramsey Lewis, a disappointed Norwich. Although before that, he hadn't actually been doing too bad. He doesn't too badly as that. So we'll see where that leaves him. Where's your cold weather boots, Mr. Mansell Lewis? They're in the left hand corner of my. Where's corner. your second set of boots? Um. You're wearing both of them, are you? No, Carl Sergeant. So where's, where's your other set of boots? Um, all the boots that I was issued are in the wardrobe, Carl Sergeant. So you're telling me you've only been issued one set of combat eyes, yeah, and one set of cold weather? Um, I, I, they haven't gone anywhere, Colonel Sergeant. I think that's, that, that's why I must have been issued, Colonel Sergeant. All right, yours and what? That's why, because they're in your fucking bag! <laughs> Lying to me, telling me you've not been issued them I and they're inside your black bag. Sorry, I got confused, Colonel Sergeant. Well, you didn't say it most to confuse you, did it, Mr Mansell Lewis? No, Colonel Sergeant. Yeah, what are you going to be like in the heat of battle when rounds of winging in around your feet, casualties taken, all right, an enemy who's coming at you, what are you going to be there? Are you going to be confused then? No, we can't afford to be confused, can we? No, Sergeant. I think the reason why I joined the army was because I wanted to be in an environment where people were motivated by, by leadership and not necessarily by money so much. My grandfather served in the Welsh Guards, and you know, yes, family family history is important to me. Bring your coaching in, Manuel. Guys, did you all read this? 
the journal of a chap called Mark Everson. He was an impeccable, impeccable officer, and it's, he's someone that we should all aspire to be like. OK, he hadn't long left this place. He'd been in theatre for four weeks. He was a new platoon commander um, before he was fatally wounded. As from speaking to people in the Welsh Guards, the Academy adjutant, who was the Battalion 2IC on the operations, company sergeant major, knows him. Colour sergeant Ridgeway Butley knows him. His decision making was purely focused on the well-being of his troops. Okay, and that's something we, we should all try and do all of the time. That's what selfless commitment is. Okay, putting the good of the, those under your command first, you know, before yourself. Okay, and hopefully, well. Fact, by the time you leave this place, you'll be doing exactly the same as well. OK, at times it's very tempting to take the easy option, Mr Mansell Lewis, isn't it? Yes, sir. Isn't it? Definitely is. But you can't. You're the platoon commander. They're going to look up to you. They're going to work for you. You're going to take them on operations. OK, and they want to know that you've got their best interests at heart. And it's definitely a good thing. Definitely. Mr Everson sat there um, in the front rank, and then I'm stood behind the battalion second in command in the second rank. As a battalion, we lost five individuals. Colonel Thornall, Major Burchill, Mr Everson, Lancelot Toby Fasfus, and uh, Dane Nelson. The way I dealt with it was I just switched off emotionally and I just had to focus on what we were doing and, and concentrate on the blokes and not let them switch off either, to be honest. There's eight people in this photo that went to Afghanistan that are currently now serving in the academy. It's the diary that uh, Lieutenant Mark Everson started writing when he went out to Afghanistan with the Welsh Guards. We've all been told to read it. There's so much of the, the kind of things that we feel at Sandhurst. There's all, all the sort of insecurities that, that we have about commanding soldiers and, and new experiences and, and, and these sorts of things. And also, it's. He's got in here, he's quite Sandhurst fresh, you know, this is his first tour, he's got his first contact in here, all this kind of thing. I didn't know him, but lots of my friends did, and they all say that he was their best friend, just a, a superb bloke. And all of his men, you know, adored him, and they all called him 007. And, you know, all the Welsh Guards' senior command, they said that he was the best junior officer in the battalion at the time. There's a bit where he says, it's rather like being on exercise, except you don't know that in five days' time a nice warm coach is going to pick you up. At the back of your mind, if you stop and have a little moment and think, in a year's time, I better know how to do this properly, because if I can't, those are real bullets. That's pretty scary. Oh, check. One, two. All right. At the moment, you're at a higher standard of overall basic admin within the block. Right. So the reason I'm moving you is so you can bring us to Akraman, yeah, and you can bring us to Whitaker on. Yes, Happy? Yes, okay, so it's not a punishment. All right, I'm not punishing you. One, two, Welcome, a very warm welcome to Brookwood Military Cemetery. Uh, what I want to do very quickly at the outset is put this visit uh, today into a bit of context for you. I spoke to you all um, in the Woolwich Hall a couple of weeks ago uh, about what we term as the contract of unlimited liability. That notion that all of us in uniform consciously forego some of the rights and freedoms that we would otherwise possibly have. And the far extension of that is the requirement, potentially, to kill or be killed. And one thing I want you to do today is consider what all that means to you as individuals. And, of course, a place like Brookwood, a place like this, there's no better place to do it. Because, of course, here we see the graves of so many people who have given their lives. So have a good think about this business that you've decided to join, this wonderful profession of ours, 
and think about that contract of unlimited liability. Fall out and off you go with Brian. Thank you very much. It just kind of made me think about the last time I went to my dad's grave and I don't know, I can just had a bit of time to reflect and just, yeah. He died tragically in a train accident. He was hit by a train at a level crossing uh, and I was about 14, 13, 14. Um, my parents had split up much younger and I was living with my stepfather, so we didn't actually see him as much as we would have done if he was at home. But he was still my dad, and it was just a massive shock. These are more recent burials up in this particular section. Afghanistan, Iraq. There's David Hicks, Mark Everson, Sean Birchall. Pertinent to to me, and I know um, some of the other DS here particularly also, uh, but I was serving on Op Herrick 10 in Afghanistan as a company commander um, uh, at the same time that these, the, these guys were killed. The only point I want to make, guys, is the stuff I've asked you to um, think about, I'm asking you to think about because it's real. And it's happening, and what we all need to do is be prepared for the moment when we, as commanders, need to deal with it, OK? And everyone deals with these sort of things in their own way. And those different ways of dealing with them have to be absolutely respected. But it'll fall to you, as commissioned officers, to get over these kind of setbacks and get your people back on task. seek to heal the wounds of war? We will. Will you work for a just future for all humanity? We will. Together we pray. Lord God, our Father, we pledge ourselves to serve you and all humanity in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of your name. Guide us by your spirit. It's, it's nice to come here. Nice to come here. Just, and just remember, to be honest, and appreciate what you've got. I had no idea his grave was there. I assumed he would be buried at home, you know, in, in, a, in a sort of, in, in a near, nearby churchyard, the nearest churchyard to his house. I mean, I, I assumed, you know, it's obviously ignorance on my part, because I thought, you know, if, if the same thing were to happen to me, I, I'd be buried at home, you know. We've got a churchyard, I can see it from my, from you know, the field behind my house, you know. But no, he's a Brookwood, he's, 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 he's there. I was so unprepared. That's his diary. Brown diary there. I was there on a visit, visited the the platoon for a couple of days. I took the photo one morning, we'd just had breakfast, had a brew, had a chat, and this was Mark's little um, bed space. This was taken about a week or so before the incident that, uh, unfortunately, um, took his life. Left on edge, you can't vote 23! I just put a surname. Well, just put the death of a brave young man. Okay. Right, fucking get it out quickly, mate. Is that recording? Yeah. Once yeah. Lieutenant Mark Everson's platoon that morning came into contact from the Taliban, one of the guys in the patrol switched on a head cam. Fuck! They are firing straight down the road, it just hit the fucking wall. That fucking wall. Please! 
All right, change your magazine. They can fucking see us down that road. As soon as you hear them words, man down. Everyone, quiet, listening to the net, just trying to monitor and picture what was going on on the ground. It's, it's not a game, is it? It's consequences. You kind of come here and it's. It was something that specifically wanted us to read for the. For selfless commitment. Selfless commitment, yeah. Just at that compound straight ahead. Right, they're moving the now. It was about 400 metres where he was shot from the patrol base. The difficult thing that day for them was the guy that would have been coordinating it and controlling it all on the ground was the guy that was on the stretcher. They relate all the training to things like that. I mean, like, even in PT, we do stretch races and stuff. And you yeah, don't do a stretch. You don't and carries and stuff. Yeah. You're not, you don't just do stretch races because it's hard Shits work. And giggles, yeah, yeah it's, it's everything's everything's for a reason. Initially, I think they thought he was just shot in the shoulder, but I think the bullet had ricocheted and gone down into his into his body as well. If you read his journal, and he was always worried about not having enough water, and then, and then in his journey, he makes a point about he wanted he wanted to speak to his uh, girlfriend and his mum, but he's like he as as a platoon commander, you're the last one to do that. You know, it's your blokes go first, so your blokes bring back um, they're the priority. Kind of, he just emphasised how much he you have to. Commit really. I suppose it makes you let a little bit. You know, the more of these things we watch, the more videos that we watch where people get killed, and the more they tell us about it, the less. Obviously, it's still a massive thing, but I suppose it. Yeah, it's that hardly yeah. desensitises you. Doesn't put you off though. No, because it's not going to be years. You hope. That's what you joined up for. Everyone that joined up in the last ten years knew that they were going to go on ops. And I think that's a big reason for joining. The amount of blood that he lost immediately told the guys, you know, that this is serious, to be honest with you. You could feel it, the emotion in the air. They loved him, they adored him. Effectively, their leader had been taken away from them. I think he was 26, I'm 23. In the grand scheme of things, that's, that's nothing really, is it, in terms of age difference. To see him at Brookwood, it was, it was like someone who kicked me in the chest. I was, uh, I was, I was so, I was, I didn't know what to do with myself. You know, I just put my hands in my pockets in case I started shaking. I think he knew the risks. He must have known the risks. Yeah. Could you do that? Could I do that? Could I go to Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Do you do what he did? Um, you take the risks he did. I hope I would. I hope I'd be able to, but I guess well, he says it. I don't know. How will I react with my first contact? Will I freeze or hopefully prove my worth? At the moment, it's a waiting game, and until that moment comes, I can only speculate. That's said perfectly. I don't know. I hope I'd be able to, um, but. 
until you reach that point, I don't think. It, it really brought home the concept of, you know, what it means to be an army officer. You, you, you put yourself, you, you sign the contract of ultimate liability, which is you, you agree to either, you know, to put yourself into a situation where you may have to kill someone or be killed yourself. And for some people, it becomes a reality, you know, and, and that's when you start weighing up what's most important in your life. You know, is it your family? Is it, is it your future? Or, or is it your army career? And is it the commitment to your guys? As a leader, you should set the example. If you're not prepared to take the same risks as those uh, of your soldiers who are under your command, then you're a coward. Right, we're going to go to Battlefield First Aid. All right, everyone's got their aid memoirs, yes? OK, Mr Barnes has been shot there, yes? We're going to open up the asthma and chest seal. Inside the asthma and chest seal, it comes like this, OK? You've got the flutter valve, which is the small valve here, OK? And then you've got the actual seal underneath, OK? All we then do is place it on right from there, so it's over the wound, and all we're going to do then is fold it out, touching from the inside of the wound outwards, OK? Once the wound... Life placed and death. On, in certain situations, is a roll of the dice. Is opened. I'm a firm believer in fate and that my time's preordained and I can't change the time or the place or wherever I might end up killed or, or whatever. You've got one lung on this side of the body, one lung down that side of the body, yeah? Keep leaving one side. Like when my father did die, that's probably sparked off some kind of leadership flame inside me. This will keep him alive for a longer period of time, OK? Everyone happy how to apply that. Grace coaching, okay. and I'm spotting. Ensure when you move to that combat position, your weapon is pointing down the range. Lewis. Yes, Coming in. Take pee. <clears throat> so, this is, this is what I think is happening, OK? But then you need to tell me if it's changed. You came here having seen the Welsh Guards and they quite liked you. I think since you've been here, you've realised that actually, even as an officer, you, you might well have to use your weapon system. Mm yada, 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 OK, when you deploy on operations. And I think maybe you're a little bit concerned by that. That's, that's, that's definitely part of it, yeah. OK, so what, what bit of it do you not like? It's, it's just something that I'm confused about. I can't justify it. And I have you know, spoken with my parents about this. And, and uh, you know, they've made the point that, you know, perhaps you, this, 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 isn't, this, isn't, you know, this isn't an issue, it's just something that I'm, I'm looking at because I'm, you know, they were saying, you know, it, it's a natural thing to think about. It's just my, it's my nature, you know, I've, I've, learned, I've learned a lot about myself at Santa. you know, certainly strengths, obviously, but yeah. also sensitivities as well, and, yeah, this, and this is one of them. You had to fire one five-round group at the white aiming marker from the kneeling or the squatting unsupported position. You're going to do your 44 weeks at Sandhurst. You're then going to go, if you do go infantry, you're then going to go up to Brecon, training up there as well. It's another sort of three months. And then you're going to do all your... You do more training, obviously, at battalion. Um, what I suggest you do is battle on till the end of this term, come back next term, and, and then we'll have another chat then. Yeah. It will be fine. OK. Thank you. All right, pleasure. The irony is I'm actually a very good shot. <laughs> 
um, and <laughs> Harbord, who was in the next door pit, said, oh, that'll be good when you need to shoot Afghan children. Good. <laughs> It's not the sort of thing you can talk to everyone about because, you know, um, at the end of the day, that's the job you're here to do. And so, um, and people who, who might not be prepared to give it a second thought would automatically assume it was weakness. Um, I don't think it is. I, th I think it's important and I think, it, you know, really sort of discussing it with yourself and coming to grips with it now actually is, it shows a strength. That's what I think personally. I'm in the middle of writing a letter to my father. He's a vicar. He's an incredibly wise man, and I have a lot of time for him. And he's trying to talk me through the process. In what situations can you justify killing people? The ceremony hasn't changed. I think the sentiments might change the more experience you get, the more relevance it has. I think you, if, it's, if it's something you've personally experienced, you've had operational experience yourself, you've lost people on operations, then of course it has a slightly uh, more direct feel. But uh, no, I think it's, it, it has no requirement to change. I don't think it ever has, and I hope it doesn't. It starts in the basis of sacrifice, and that spans all conflicts. That, we've been involved in, but then clearly you use your own personal experience. And so Iraq and Afghanistan for me. Am I prepared to, to die for my country? I, yeah, I am. Patriotism, there's something very stupid about patriotism, something quite blind. I think you have to find a better reason than that to be in the army. Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. I mean, it's just been completely ridiculed. War is horrible. Conflict is evil. Though unfortunately and sadly sometimes necessary. But it's important to remember that even in the blackest hour amid fighting and fear, deeds of courage, bravery, loyalty and honour can and do shine through. Today we gather in humility to honour the countless numbers who made the ultimate sacrifice. We commemorate and pray for all who have died in conflict. We remember especially those who have most recently laid down their lives in Afghanistan. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. Some of you, if not most of you, will be called upon to close with and kill the enemy. 20% of soldiers in World War II used their personal weapon. By the time we got to Vietnam, 95% of people used their personal weapon. I would suggest that is certainly where we're about in Afghanistan, or certainly that's the mindset you have to deploy with, okay? So if you think this is not your business, you are in 
the wrong organization. It is everybody's business, and it is particularly prevalent because you are going out to command people. It is not simply just you closing with killing the enemy. It is the people you lead, and they will expect you to have a very, very clear and moral, ethical understanding of the morality of killing before you deploy. Right, Commander Boyce, who wants platoon commander? Who really wants it? He's just putting their hand up because they think that's what I want them to do. Mr. Mansell Lewis, yes, platoon commander. Mr. McNeish, platoon sergeant. Mr. Twyman, runner. Mr. Sudworth, rad up. One section, commander. They will all take over platoons and they will deploy to Afghanistan. Uh, and at that stage, they can anticipate that they will take over one of the patrol bases, be responsible, A, for its intimate security, um, but equally for dominating the ground outside that patrol base. The intent is to destroy all the enemy within our boundaries. Scheme and manoeuvre, three section, you're already suppressing. I want you to stay there, two section. You're doing a left flanking manoeuvre, OK? Oh, Mr. Mansell, you perfectly happy, yeah? Um, yeah. Where are we aiming towards? The, the smoke in the center of the... No, the left-hand corner of that woodblock. Left-hand corner of the woodblock. When you go on exercise, you have to show loads of aggression and as if you're going to go and kill someone. You think, God, I might actually... I will actually have to do this one time. They're only short of battles. Um, and not only that, we haven't got the ammunition to make it last as how long some battles do last. But currently, within um, in the likes of Iraq and Afghanistan, battles are going on. I've heard muckers been in battles for like 24 hours. Follow the bond line across left, yeah. So you hit the ravine that's running up with all the little trees in it. Fold it up, and there's a really obvious person standing in it. And there's some smoke off to the right. Keep going, rapid fire! A bit of cake and arse. There's a bit of embarrassment, to be honest. This section is shocking. There's no fire support from the section down there. It's just not, not very good, really. What can they do to rectify? Show a bit of aggression, a bit, bit of determination, a bit of want to kill the enemy. Fucking get in there, get down, get low. The enemy is fucking 20 metres over in that direction. You fucking idle bastard! Get in That's there! Depression crawling. Post that fucking grenade. Let's go. Let's go. Go, 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 go! Fireman's carry him. Just take my Who is it? Yeah. Who is it? Someone. He's brown bread anyway. The casualty's dead. Come on, guys, let's get on it. Three, six. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Get on it quickly. Stop fucking faffing. One more. Stop! Fuck. It's so hard. Stop referring to our fucking dead as dead. Yeah? There's no point leaving him fucking a K, K behind. He comes with us, right? We don't just fucking leave him. Because if we leave somebody like that, all that's going to happen is then fucking Taliban or whoever it is get hold of that fucking um, dead, OK? And then they start fucking making videos of cutting him up and things like that, posted on fucking YouTube, and his family sees that, and then it's fucking publicity for them, OK? But not only that, it's not a fucking good thing for us, right? It's about getting rid of people who, who, who can't sort of grin and bear the cold. Um, who haven't got the capability okay, to look left went? and right at the guys in their foxhole and draw strength from their oh, character. Seven, seven. Yeah, it's definitely survival. Mr. Vance Lewis, get your map out and show me where we are. When was you going to tell me? So you've lost the map now on the area. This goes for everyone. He's now lost the map on the area that's got positions marked up, harbour area marked upon it. Okay, so they now know where our harbour area is. So now when we go back after doing advance the contact all fucking day, move into our harbour area, next minute we start taking incoming and next minute we've got an assault coming onto our position, resulting in a full platoon getting killed because one individual decides to lose his map, yeah? 
You've got to fucking maintain your kit and equipment, fellas. All right? Let's reference the top of the hill. Go and find out and see if there's anyone on the other side of it. Let's go. Hurry up, Mr. Mansell Lewis. Get up there now. Let's go. Hurry up. Get your weapon. Go. Start doubling on. We'll start the making platoon join you. Quicker. Do the command of hope change, sir. The, the, there are lots of parts of me that, that find it difficult to digest what we're being taught some of the time. Keep going, Mr. Mansell Lewis. Hurry up. Colour Sergeant Beza, he said, you know, in a situation where you have to kill someone, it's either you or it's them. And so for him, in every situation, he'd do anything to secure the lives of his men and also his life. Let's go, Mr. Mansell is back now! On the up! On me! Come on! And if that means taking someone else's life, then he's prepared to do that. I don't think anything can probably prepare you adequately for the uncertainty of when you step out of the patrol base on that first day. How it's going to be, how you'll respond when you come under fire. Uh, you know, you can practice it as much as you want, but you don't know until you get that crack thump of uh, rounds going past you or rounds la landing close to you or indeed uh, soldiers under your command being injured um, or killed. Please pull in, sir, please. Yes, please, Mr. Answorth. Right. Reet. So, Carlos someone tells me you came to saw him earlier on. I presume this is about what we spoke about in about week eight of last term. Sir. Okay, so speak to me then. Um, there are parts of the job that I'm. I don't think I could actually do. Oh, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't have any need to take a, take another man's life, sir. One thing I would just say to you: there's very, very few people in the army who want to end a life. Don't think that there's a, you know, everyone who joins the army has to be lusting after blood because that's not, that's not the case at all. The reason why you do it, if you look to your right and you look to your left, those are the two reasons why you do it, OK, for the men that are with you. So if that's got anything to do with it, then, you know, I'd like you to reconsider. What I'll do now, though, I'll speak to the company commander. I'll make him fully aware. He'll probably speak to you either today or tomorrow, OK, and then we'll get the ball rolling from there. Yes, sir. OK, as long as you're 100% content that this is the right decision for you. OK? You got any questions for me or any dramas? Oh, no, no, that's it, thanks, sir. OK, fine. Um, yes, you may, Karen. Thank you very much. I, I did think to myself a number of times, you know, hypothetically, if, if I were to lose my legs, if I was to lose my testicles, and I was to watch all my best friends grow up and have families while I was sat in a chair without any kids. Knowing that I... Knowing that happened in, the, you know, in a war that was 3,500 miles away from home. I, I'd, I'd struggle to work out, actually, if, if everything was worth it. Um, and that's, that's certainly something that I've thought a lot about as well. Really. He's clearly not a stupid guy, and he's looked into it, so... I've told him that I would speak to you. No, that's fine. I mean, he's, yeah, he's always had the opportunity to, to raise his hand up. I think the only thing I might offer him, I'll interview him, uh, what I'll offer him is possibly a chat with the Commandant, because the Commandant has said to me that he's willing to talk to him about it, if he wishes to. If not, we'll start processing it. Fine, thank you. Brilliant. All right, sir. Thanks. Uh, numbers are... I heard they're dwindling. I mean, numbers I mean, are dwindling. Don't take it personally. I don't. <laughs> Fix bayonets! OK, if any point in this lesson I ask you what bayonet is for, you are to shout at the top of your voice to kill, kill, kill! What's the bayonet for? Kill, kill, kill! I didn't realise I had the girls platoon on the range today. What's the bayonet for? Kill, kill, kill! At any point I ask you what makes the grass grow, you scream blood, blood, blood. What makes the grass grow? Blood, blood, blood! I can't hear you! Blood, blood, blood! I can't hear you! Mr. Mansell Lewis, come in. Thanks, sir. Grab a seat. You look mildly apprehensive. Sit down. Kill, kill, kill! God! Ah! Rubbish! High pork! No, no, no! 
I'm more concerned as to why you think uh, you can't you can't reach a moral position on having, if necessary, as the last resort to have to pull the trigger on someone. That's the key question I've got. It just there's so many sensitivities that flag up the moment I, I really sort of commit myself to thinking about it hard. Yeah. Um, and so... What's your father's view on it? Well, he, he's, he's very matter-of-fact, you know, he said that, you know, we do need an army, we, we, do, we do need to defend ourselves, um, and if that means taking someone's life, then, of course, it's the last... Last resort. Last resort, but if it needs to be done, then... You then need good men to do it. Well, that's right, yeah. So you're not... You're not taking issue with the fact that there is, uh, as, a, as a last resort, a legitimate time when you may have to take someone's life. You don't disagree with that. No, I understand that. No, you understand that. You're just really, so your case is really that you personally would rather not do that. You, you personally find it particularly distasteful to do. Is that, is that it? Yeah, I, I have reservations. I, I wouldn't want the responsibility of doing it. Yes, that's, that's well, the case. officers have to... You know, you have to do exactly what you're order, ordering your men to do. Yes. So you don't come out of it well, really, and you're probably feeling a bit uncomfortable. Kill! 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 My my concern is: is there a trend there? I sense not. I sense you are a one-off, as it were. Not that there will be others, but you're you're pretty unique. Um, but I need to get a little bit of that reassurance. Have any, are things changing? Is there a concern over Afghanistan? You know, I need, I need to get a feel for trends. Very important as Commandant, in case it's affecting other people. Uh, in this case, I think you are the only one, because I've asked. Uh, there, there will always be some who have more questions when you're talking about morality of killing than others. Um, and it's a very, very, very important issue. Probably the most important issue, because you can't sort of commission through here um, unless you've got this one straight. So what you're doing, leaving, basically, is the right thing if you can't get your conscience absolutely clear. Uh, so I have no, no problem with that. Thanks, sir. into them to get them to understand what it really might be like to have to kill someone, what it might feel like when you see that man go down. Oh, God! Oh, God! Ultimately, when it all goes wrong, you may have to put yourself in that front line for your men. They've got to understand that. Take some deep breaths, calm yourselves down. I now certify you as steely idealers of death. There are a few who didn't have what it takes, OK, to do that, I don't think. There are people stood here who do not think could do that for real. However, a majority of you, I believe, could pull that out of your fucking ass if the shit hits the fan and it is required of you. Not a bad effort. I saw some pretty horrific sights in Iraq in 2003, and some decisions were made there which came through me, which I will live with for the rest of my life. Right, everybody get back in the wagon now. There was a, an Iraqi company position that was absolutely flattened. We put huge amounts of fire on it. Thereafter, leaflets were sent out to all the others, those that remained, all the way around it. And within 24 hours, they started to surrender into squares. It meant that we would save casualties. We were not going to have to 
kill more of the enemy than we absolutely had to. There are times when you have to be ruthless. I was just short of the mark, despite the fact that I, I've, I've given the course in almost, almost five months, it's, it's still very much that way. Um, and I, I'm glad I, I discovered it in training. You know, the worst thing would have been to discover it on the plane out to Afghanistan or in theatre. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are a couple of people who, who discover it in theatre themselves. He don't really want to go to Afghan, I think. I mean, he's got this thing, he doesn't want to kill someone. I mean, no one wants to kill someone, but if you're joining the army, you're pretty much, in some way, you're going to either service another person to kill someone or... You know, it's, it's, that's what the army does. So it's a bit like that for my way. I'm like, well, why did you join the army? Um, and then he's saying about, you know, he don't want to lose his arms, legs, bollocks in Afghan. But, you know, he wants to have a family and all that stuff, and that's important to... Uh, What's important to him at the minute, so fair dues. I thought you'd have thought about that before going for a minute, to be honest. I had doubts about whether we were in Afghanistan for the right reasons. I thought I could sort of suppress it. If we leave Afghanistan in 2015, then you do have to ask yourself, what do those guys die for? It's not our place to question it. Whatever your private thoughts on the campaign, you toe the line because it's bad for morale. It's bad for, you know, if you're, if you're the opinion that the campaign is a complete waste of time, what good is that when you've got to explain to a, an 18-year-old private that's just lost his mate and you think that the war is for fuck all? You don't say that. You, you say that it is for, you know, you're, you're defending British interests and that you're doing it to serve and protect the British public from the threat of Islamic fundamentalism and al-Qaeda and you're preventing them using Afghanistan as a base on which to launch attacks onto the British mainland. You're willing to risk life and limb for your country, but then the people that you're being selfish to are the ones that actually are the ones that you care most about. I don't know about the parachute regiment. I know your heart's set on the paras. And it will come down to you. It's only only down to you. Please go on, sir, please. Yeah, please do. Still to come this evening, there's drama headed your way as our army season continues with Tumble Down next. And there's plenty more army content online too. Stay with us to find out more about BBC4's army collection in just a second.